Um, look, the topic of my presentation today is SDP's IRL. Um, and yes, I've got teenage kids, so I like all the lingo. Um, and, but we like the lingo as well within this industry. It's all about abbreviations and acronyms, suitable duties programs in real life is what I want to talk about today. So I thought I would continue that theme. Why do they fail? <laughs> I was rehearsing this with my kids and they're like, oh, mum, you shouldn't say that. Um, I don't know what you're thinking. Why do they fail? Why, with all of our best efforts sometimes, do they fail? Um, and not necessarily fail. Sometimes they even break down before they even get off the ground. How many SDPs do you guys write that are those beautiful, perfect, simple, four to six weeks, return to pre-injury duties, a really clear-cut medical clearance, no yellow flags, um, no prospect of common law, nailing it. Hopefully from your perspective, a lot. From my perspective, not so much. The OTs tend to only get called in when things aren't going so well. But who am I? This was me last night, uh, watching the State of Origin. Pretty close resemblance, don't you think? Well, who am I? Yes, I'm the warm and fuzzy person. I'm the one that comes in um, and is often at the end of the phone asking you uh, for the impossible. I want you to develop and identify for me those suitable duties, those meaningful, purposeful tasks. Um, I want you to create something out of their pre-injury role that may not have existed before. <coughs> but as you can see, I'm not wearing any rose-coloured glasses. I'm not wearing a big hug me sign. Um, I'm wearing the independent real life perspective. So someone who comes from working at the Royal Brisbane Hospital and has seen how injuries recover and rehabilitate. Someone who comes from working in a workers' compensation area and seeing that delicate balance between injured workers and employer demands. And someone who has experienced, I guess, that common law area of completing functional capacity assessments to try and minimise future economic loss. I'm not the sceptical supervisor, I'm not the cranky co-worker, I'm not the claim pressured case manager, I'm the OT. But don't let my youthful appearance fool you, just in case you were worried. Um, we get a bit down and dirty in the industries. On average I visit between two and five workplaces a day. We don't just sit in our office developing suitable duties programs that look beautiful. I may not be your best friend or the injured worker's best friend, but I'm engaged to help develop a successful return to work program in real life. I can read the culture of a workplace usually within the first five minutes of walking in the door. And at times you can often get a pretty good grasp of that, grip of that, from even making the initial appointments on the telephone how it's going to go down. So who are you? Gosh, it's so obviously you weren't working, watching the State of Origin last night. There's more to yawning than meets the eye. Research shows that yawning is contagious. And so when you see the word yawn, or look at photos of people mid yawn, or watch film of actual yawns, you will start to feel like yawning. Also, the more you're affected by the images, the more empathic you are. So if you're feeling the need to yawn right now, then you tend to be good at reading other people's emotions. Whereas if you don't feel like yawning, then you're more than emotional either. <laughs> and so if you want to gain a fun insight into your friends, just ask them to watch this video and see if they yawn. Stop. So no pressure. But if you yawned, it would appear that you're all in the right type of industry. Excellent, up the back. And don't worry, if you didn't, Terry Killian's coming along later and you're going to love his presentation. <laughs> okay, ooh. so work, we're all talking about it. It's in all the pop songs. Rihanna, Fifth Harmony, apparently that's what my child said. To work over Queensland, it's on all our TV ads and radio stations. Um, it's the in thing, apparently, in case you didn't know. But why? Well, work is good for us. Work is good for my patients. Work is good for your injured workers. Work is good for employers. Work is good for successful claim management. It's the ultimate win-win. The difficulty is sometimes getting the injured workers and the unions and their advocates on board with that. 
The health benefits of work document goes a long way in helping us change this mind shift, particularly with one of the most important key holders in our group, which are the doctors. Hopefully you're all familiar with the position statement. Yeah. Okay, this is some of the stats from it. You'll actually see a prompt on it on the current workers' compensation certificate, um, which actually prompts certifying doctors to consider the health benefits of work when they're certifying the workers' capacity. Hopefully they do see that little bit. So what does it mean? Basically it means absence makes a claim grow longer. Work absence perpetuates itself. The longer they're off work, the harder it is to get them back. Hopefully you've seen these stats. So basically we've got, in the first 20 days, up to about 70% chance of getting the injured worker back to work. And then unfortunately it's pretty much a downward spiral from there. So at 45 days off work, we go down to about 50% and so forth. So where do we need to act the best? Where do we need to get these suitable duties happening? This is the zone that we want to talk about. So it's not always about return to work. We want to start looking at that stay at work, keeping people at work rather than helping them or, or having them start off. So that golden theme is about recovering at work, rehabilitating at work. There's so many different names that we use and I think at times that bamboozles people. Alternative duties, light duties, suitable duties. I actually really just like the term sensible duties. I hate the word light duties. I never use it because I think it's got a negative connotation to it. But just as many names as there are, there's as many different ways that we can guide our injured workers to get to that same result, which is rehabilitation. It can't be a one-stop SDP shop. I love job dictionaries, I love those types of concepts, but we can't pick and choose, I guess, the same type of SDP for every worker within our organisation. You have to individualise it. Because as we know, not every injured worker is the same. So where do we start? How do we look at these alternate duties and transferable skills for a million of different types of personalities of people? And not just different types of people, but I guess all the different types of environments that you work in and the challenges that come with that. Fly in, fly out. Third party work sites that stipulate their own kind of um, capacity for work and cold board medical fitness assessments that are out of your control sometimes. PPE, they've got to be able to wear steel cap boots in order to get back to work, but they've got a swollen foot, can't get steel cap boots on. There's a myriad of challenges. Travel, if they can't drive, if they can't fly, does that rule out return to work? Shouldn't. Medications, that's another one as well, where the injured worker will say, oh, I'm an endo and I can't possibly be near anywhere, anywhere near machinery. Yeah, probably correct. But how do we then work with the doctors to manage this process moving forward? And how do we engage these injured workers early and positively? Come on. Oh my gosh. why people are skeptical hopefully this is not the experience that we're giving people but you know what I bet it is sometimes oh what are you doing oh. okay so what's our job our job and when I'm talking about our I'm meaning rehab providers rehab coordinators the people that are developing the suitable duties programs our job is to create something out of something it's not something out of nothing because they've got a job our goal is to get them back to work so we've got something that we can work from but how do we do that to create these sensible duties? Four key terms, four, yeah. Temporary, they are temporary. 
And this has got to be clearly communicated from the outset. So many times you have employers say, I know they're just using this injury to try to get to a different role or they're trying to get into the office or they're trying to get to a different site. Okay, very clearly from the outset, I am here to help you get back to your pre-injury role. Okay, Anything, the only thing that's ever guaranteed in any insurance process, whether it's workers' compensation or self-insurers or CTP, is that a claim begins and a claim ends. I say this at least five times a day to injured workers and our goal is to help them rehabilitate during that period of time. They need to be modified. So this is where you need to look within what an injured worker's capacity is and their medical restrictions. And we're gonna talk a little bit about, well, how do you get that? It's like sometimes getting blood out of a stone. They need to be graduated. They can't just be filing for six weeks and then they're gonna get their fitness for work certificate and then they're gonna go back to, you know, out on site up to 25 kgs rigging, doing whatever they normally do. Okay, they have to be graduated to match their physical increase. And essentially then they need to transition and you need to have a way that documents and shows how it's gonna transition. They can't just go from the office, again, back out to the field. It has to be able to have a transition. Sounds simple enough? Yeah. So how do I do it? Well, the way that I tend to look at it is I start with their end role and work backwards. So during my initial assessments, the first question that I start to ask people after I've gone through all their injury background is tell me about your pre-injury role. Okay, I don't want to necessarily look at what the medical certificate says now because injured workers will be very focused on, I can only do four hours a day, I can only lift up to three kilos and really I need to have breaks, 15 minutes sitting, standing, all things like that. That's great. I need to know what do I have to get you back to because then I work my way back from that. So we modify their current position rather than thinking straight from the outset from their supervisor or management going, oh, we'll just put them in the office for six weeks and then we'll get them back out. Start with where they have to end up and then work our way back from there. The job bank and dictionaries can be a really useful tool, um, particularly because it helps explain and I guess uh, detail what things are available within your organisation. But again, it's not about completely removing someone from their normal role and putting them in another role. It's working with their tolerances, their capacity, their team structure, you know, their medical kind of plan, everything about that. And RCOs are in the perfect position for this. You guys are internal to the organisation. You should know the policies and procedures within your organisation to be able to access and understand how all that works. To keep it goal directed, because at times that can be the hardest thing. We often talk about the hierarchy and no, it's not like the food triangle, although we can kind of consider it the same type of way. The bomb at the top is the pre-injury duties, PID. That's what we want to get people back to, okay? So we have to set our sights on that same employer, same role. At times I'll go into an employer or I'll do my initial calls and the employer will say, they're not going to get back here. Might as well look at host. Think, let's start, start from the end and then work back rather than going, actually, they're not going to get back. Why even try to start with? Okay. The section, second option we need, normally look at is then keeping them in that same role, but maybe some permanent restrictions. People hate the word permanent restrictions, but it doesn't need to be anything that's feared, I guess. So for example, I do a lot of work with boners and knife hands in the meatwork industries. Now at times they may develop tendonitis injuries that permanently restricts them from using any type of vibration type tools like wizard knives or band saws. Now that actually may be a very small part of their role. And again, it's up to the employer, but if they can accommodate that accommodation or that modification permanently, then it's a win-win. The injured worker can go back to their original role with just having a restriction of using any type of vibration tools. So that's often the question that I'm asking employers. Can you accommodate that restriction, that permanent restriction? And then I guess moving on down the hierarchy, we're looking at new employers, different roles or same roles, retraining, vocational redirection. And I know that somebody's gonna be talking a little bit more about that later on today. Okay. Um, Maximising independent functioning, this is one I guess we often used to use for more serious catastrophic type injuries. Saying that though the industry is changing with the developments in equipment, modifications and accommodations, it's not a given now that people that have catastrophic injuries can't get back to work. I was only doing a workplace assessment yesterday for an injured worker that actually sustained quite a serious spinal injury and is a paraplegic and works for a large aged care organisation in their maintenance area. And we were talking about how they can modify their doors to make them automatic. They're getting him back to his pre-injury role exactly the same. 
And so hopefully that will be actually a story that might be talked about in the future forum because it's a really good option. Okay, but where do we start? You've got your TI Med Cert. How do we get this off the ground to starting the Suitable Duties programs? Again, those job di dictionaries, similar to what Shane was talking about, those task analysis where you've already got to detail what the physical requirements of the role are, are a good place to start. Because then you know what the ranges, what the weights, what the requirements are that people need to do to be in that role. The next step is that we are in that medical model. So certainly as Dr. Edwards is going to talk about, the medical certificate is kind of the be all and end all. As we know though, and unfortunately, I'm sorry, Dr. Edwards, many doctors don't see that right side of the medical certificate. Would you agree? So it then becomes difficult for people who don't have that experience of injury management and rehab to go, well, I don't know what they should be doing. What can they do? I'm not sure, where do we start? Okay, this is where bringing together your knowledge, using the allied health team, using the physio. You know what a really good port of call is? Ask the injured worker. Yep, pretty simple and basic, but ask them what they're able to do as well. And then you clarify that information with doctors, with physios, whoever else. Okay, that's how we can get it off the ground, first of all. Don't wait till you've got that suitable duties tick on the med cert before you're developing a suitable duties program. I say that through and through because you can anticipate the progression of an injury, the progression of what's going to happen at your workplace, and you can help develop those suitable duties programs to feed that information back to the doctors to get that sign off and to get the med cert changed. Okay. So how do we go from suitable duties to suitable duties? Again, at times, look, I'd love to say you do that simple suitable duties program number one, you get a beautiful medical clearance, everyone's happy and dandy, they get back to their pre-injury role. The reality is in these types of industries in complex cases, you can go from suitable duties program number one to suitable duties program number two to suitable duties program number three. The thing is, don't be a passive participant in that. Don't wait for the med certs to keep coming in to go, oh, they've got another two weeks. Oh, they've got another two weeks. Oh, they've got another two weeks. At some point in time, talk with your claim officer and go, where are we going with this? What's the end result? You know what? And maybe propose a suitable duties program that goes for a period of time that the doctor can help feed back on to go, you know what? This is what I would expect them to recover with over this period of time as well. A classic example is post-surgery for injured workers. If you can obtain that information in terms of how long they're going to be off work for, what's their likely recovery before they have the surgery, most of the time we can have suitable duties programs up, ready, signed off to go at that post-op review. It may still be another couple of weeks, but we've got it ready to go. Why delay the process when you finally do get that tick on the med cert to then start back at work? And review the program. I think that's similar to, you know, don't just let suitable duties program number seven roll into suitable duties program number eight at some point we have to be reviewing it all the way through to make sure that they're recovering and improving and if they're not we need to case conference to understand why look it sounds cliche but it shouldn't be unexpected when we get this medical clearance and we get that successful return to work if we've guided that claim process the whole way through we normally are anticipating and advising the injured worker well what do you think is going to happen when you go to that next review with the specialist and at times, if we've kept the communication channels open, injured workers should be saying to us, yeah, no, I think I'm feeling pretty good. I reckon I'm going to get a clearance. Great. So we're guiding that process with the injured workers all working together. So that communication and being really transparent and open with the injured worker the whole way through is really critical. This is where it becomes difficult, I guess, for the employers. Because from work covers point of view and at times external providers, this is where we go, you know what? We've done a great job. Awesome. See you later. We're finalising. Then you may be left with an injured worker that isn't 100% fit because a medical clearance doesn't necessarily mean 100% fit. Or they may have to start consider those permanent restrictions. Or you may need to consider an alternate role. That's where you need to start looking at your internal processes and work out, do we need a functional capacity evaluation? Do you need to refer to an occupational physician to start working out what they can do? That's beyond the scope of the work cover claim. And then the other things that we need to look at, I guess, is that whole ageing process, which it's terrible. Fortunately, it's not happening to me. I'm in denial. Um, because obviously, with, as we age, that injury process tends to be more chronic and progressive. So we can kind of close our eyes a little bit and go, yep, we'll get them back to work out on site. But the fact is, people are going to continue to age and degenerate. And we need to have SDPs and ongoing programs that go beyond those simple programs. You need to have that kind of consideration. You need to be mindful of what their functional abilities are moving forward. Because the worst thing is we're not here to get people back to work 
to re-injure again. Okay, but we've got to look at this as opportunities. Hope it's not, it's not all doom and gloom. Despite all these problems and challenges, most people get back to work. Yeah? I guess the issue that I have at times and coming from, as I said, an insurance background and then being out in private practice, a lot of people have really bad experiences with that. Would you agree? So that's what we want to change. And in my experience, there's three big opportunities that impact on a person's experience in the workers' comp area. The first one is out of our control but it plays such a big part. The injury itself. If we don't have a clear diagnosis, if we don't have the right doctors on board, if we don't have the right investigations undertaken, if we can go on for six months before we've got a very clear diagnosis of the injury, tick, 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 tick with your claim. Okay, there's our durations already happening. And yes, that's out of our control to a degree, but it doesn't mean you can't influence with the people that's involved in the claim making sure you're getting the right input, referring to your OC physician specialist for case conferencing, file reviews, getting whatever information you need. I remember a doctor once told me that he always listens to his patients, which is, which is good, um, because you get, they've got that sixth sense. People know if there's something wrong with them. And likewise, now if I have injured workers that say, I just, you know, I know the ultrasound, the x-ray was negative, but I just know there's something wrong. But yep, according to the insurance process, we've probably still got to go through getting a specialist referral to then get the MRI to pre all that, da, 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 da. How can we hasten that up? I rarely let people go to see specialists without trying to get that MRI done first. Because we all know people are going to go to their specialists, go get an MRI, we'll see you in two weeks. Tick, 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 cost, cost, cost. We don't want that. So what can we change? Characteristics. Characteristics of the injured worker, characteristics of the employer and the workplace these challenging workplaces, the environment, the equipment and tool design, rosters, shutdown procedures, deadlines and overtimes, these have a massive impact on the success of someone's return to work program. The social stigma with being off work, despite all our efforts and TV shows and um, radio songs about work, there's still that kind of compo culture at times in workplaces and it can still be pretty, pretty bloody strong. So ask yourself, is your workplace a compo or a concern? culture, where, where are you coming from, okay? The return to work coordinator is a key. If you've got an inappropriately unskilled person in that position, they're your driving force within your organisation. Don't handball it to the new admin officer, just go, oh, by the way, you're the rehab coordinator. Good luck with that. Um, they have to be respected and supportive um, and they have to be really well informed. They have to have an ear to management to get this all happening. So that leads to, to the support. The systemic and organisational issues, providing things like on-site rehab and medical support have got awesome research to account for the results that people get for that. Providing those suitable, meaningful duties, having that trust between stakeholders. All too often you'll go to initial assessment and the employer will pull you aside and go, just letting you know, we saw them on Facebook on the weekend and we've got really big, that's fine. And that's probably what Terry, Terry Killian needs to know about. From my perspective, we're in a no-fault system. We put our poker face on. We're here to help them get back to work. Yes, they have a life outside of work, and you know what? I actually really applaud people to stay active within their normal type of life outside of work. That's really important because if they're active outside of work, they can stay active at work. We just have to get that happening. And all these other issues sometimes is what's preventing that. Timely processing of paperwork. Well, in a no paper system with email or whatever it may be. Insurance companies, employers, doctors, sometimes that's out of our control, but make sure you're submitting the paperwork on time early, keeping the injured workers in the loop. That communication, coordination, don't just say those words. Sometimes they can be beautiful policies and procedures. If that's not how your organisation actually is in practice, there's no point in having beautiful policies. Um, and having that level of understanding about work cover issues and customer advisors are fantastic to get them on the other end of the phone, get them to come out to your workplace, make sure that they understand your business and that you understand the work cover process because if you're the one that's explaining that to the injured worker. You can try and ignore all of that if you want, but if you do the same thing, you get the same outcomes. We want to try to give people the white picket fence experience. Okay? Wouldn't it be nice if people got out the other end of their workers' comp claim and said, that was great. You know, it was a really good process, doctors were great, work cover was fantastic and my employer, gosh, that, the way that they accommodated me back on deck was terrific. Okay, so it's looking at that whole picture. Straight away, things like, and I guess this is in a workers comp area, we're so in tune to go, okay, you've got a fracture injury, right, let me just look at your, your fracture, that's what employers look at. 
Okay, but look at the other things. Is that your right foot? How are you going to drive to and from work? How are you going to get a steel cap boot on? At times, employers have never even kind of asked those questions before I get on board. And I guess as OTs, that's what we're trained for, is to look at that whole person. You live in a high set house, how are you getting up and down the stairs? You've got to pick up kids from school, all that kind of stuff. How are you managing fatigue with your medications? You're worried about re-injury. Ongoing symptoms, management of medications at work, having a stretching regime, using a heat pack at work. How can you accommodate all of this so the injured worker is welcome back to their job? Ongoing monitoring. Don't discharge this to work cover or to the OT or the doctor. You guys have to be doing the monitoring. We are the accessory people in the process. We come in and go out. You guys are the constants. If anything, we have to be the bad cops. You have to be the good cops because you're the ones that are having that constant relationship with the injured worker. Addressing the hazards. This is another big one that injured workers will say to me, I'm really worried about re-injury. No, they may not have a psychological claim, but a classic example was I had an injury the other day where a um, client had a de-tipping, a quite severe de-tipping injury from moving a pot plant of all things. Um, nothing that you would have kind of expected to happen. Anyway, when she went back to work to take her med sets back a few days later, she was quite traumatized because the, the same, same pot plant was still there. Obviously that's fine, but there was still the blood drips and droplets all around it. You know, so it's thinking about addressing those hazards. All too often we get caught up in that litigation process and Terry can talk about that, but make sure injured workers are welcome back and that you can almost put yourself in their shoes. Write this accommodation plan. How are you going to accommodate it? It's very easy to go, suitable duties program, so many hours, thanks, five minutes, good. Um, now you've just thrown me. Um, write an accommodation plan. So we write about the hours upgrading and the tasks upgrading. How are we going to accommodate all these other aspects? Management of fatigue, management of medication, all things like that. Educating the workplace, getting the supervisors on board, um, and managing things if aren't, things aren't going well. Don't just progress a suitable duties program. It's quite obvious that they're not managing it. And the other thing I guess is those mental health symptoms as well. We've become very good at managing adjustment to injury issues now. There's no point in sweeping it under the carpet. We are best to address it, manage it, get them treatment for it, and then hopefully continue to progress with the claim. Just quickly, host employment will solve all my problems. Now certainly the Recover at Work program has had some great successes. In my experience, there is such a small percentage of claims that I can transition into successful permanent work. If it happens, it's like ah, a red letter day. Awesome. But it doesn't happen often. So don't be fooled thinking, oh, work cover, just host them. Because if I'm the injured worker, what's my perception of that? They don't want me. They're not accommodating me. This is them trying to get rid of me. If any way you're looking at host employment, make sure it's the employer that's explaining that to the injured worker. Again, you're all too quick to discharge our responsibility to say to work cover, I'll just offer them host employer, we can't do it. You be the ones to explain to the injured worker saying, we're worried about your re-injuring, we can't provide safe and meaningful duties, we want to help you recondition so that we can get you back to work. How much better would that sound if it's coming from the employer directly? Bottom line, it's not rocket science. We need to be empathetic, straightforward communication, common sense practicality, or too often we get caught up in writing, beautiful suitable duties program that management love but the fact is the suitable duties programs aren't for management they're for an injured worker they should be messy they should be flexible they should be detailed because basically yeah you can't control a lot of other sorry I'm rushing through this because I want to get to the farm oh my god um, essentials for the return to work team be optimistic and reassure I don't think I see the word skeptical on there okay that's really important. If you've got one of those big flags above your head going, heard through the grapevine, you did this outside of work, that's not going to help this claim. That will help the common law aspect and certainly speak with the solicitors about that. But from my perspective, poker face, we are here to help people get back to work and recover from their injury. We're in a statutory no fault system. Okay, Convey that optimism, reassure the injured worker. How many times injured workers say to me, I know they're just trying to get rid of me. Okay. We have to reassure them about that. Setting those time frames and expectations. And if you at first you don't succeed, try something different, okay? This is sometimes the point where I get called in and go, I'm to suitable duties program number 30 and I think they're already drafting their notice of claim out the back, help. You know, don't keep doing the same thing over and over again. We've got to do something different to help it get back to work. Are we right? Are you sure? Yes. Okay. Okay, so you can change this process. 
It's fantastic hearing Shane's example and I wish that every workplace I went into had that fabulous system in place. Unfortunately, everyone doesn't have the resources and the volume, I guess, to be able to accommodate something like that. So the reality is we're all at different stages of managing our claims. But what can you do to help make it more positive for the injured worker? Giving them that white picket experience. Set ex expectations for your employees early and often. Do this before they have injuries. Do this in your toolbox talks. Talk about the policies and procedures that the workplace have in place so that it's not just something beautiful that you have in folders. Use those functional job descriptions as communication tools. And that was going to be something that I asked you, Shane. Do you use those job descriptions to forward to doctors, to forward to OTs or physios so that we know what we have to do to get someone back to work? Okay? That if I know they're on site, they've got to use this, this and this tool and they've got to lift or buddy lift up to about 36 kilos. But actually in the procedure it only says 18, but the reality is it's about 36. They're things that we need to know up front. Consider a rapid approval process. The delays, the tick, 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 you can see those stats. It starts to work against us straight away. If anything, focus those early efforts on clarifying the diagnosis and making sure everyone, everyone understands what the injury is that you're dealing with. It's all too easy. I mean, when we used to have those diagnoses of back strain, repetitive strain injury, we need to know a clear and concise diagnosis so that we know what we're treating. Okay, so again, don't aim to have the best looking suitable duties programs. Um, the key thing for me is when I go into larger employers and their suitable duties programs look the same for every employee. Same types of duties, almost the same type of upgrades and timeframes, or if there is upgrades. They've got to be individualised. Make them a little bit messy, as I say, okay? Don't do them for management, but make sure that management are on board with the process. Make sure they know about an accommodation plan. And that's not a housing plan, that's how are we giving them that white picket fence? How are we giving them and considering all those other issues rather than just what date are they starting back to work? When are they upgrading? When are we getting to pre-injury duties? Because we get so caught up in the timeframes rather than someone's functional abilities, okay? Create that culture of welcome back. For those who might be as young as I am about welcome back hot, I'd like think of that strategy. Train your supervisors to avoid being negative. That's a really key thing. And I think that's probably why people are asking that. All too often we'll do these great plans and then you know, unbeknownst to us, they're getting flack or something from their supervisors day in, day out and coworkers. That's a really critical thing to address and manage it. And it's a constant thing that you have to keep managing. But look, just in case if you're getting a little jaded by the process, I think it's important to go back to what we're all here to do just to give you that warm and fuzzy. Jeez, oh, three, three times. <laughs> Taking notes, it's really interesting. Just the music relaxes you, doesn't it? Maybe you should play this in your office when you're doing your initial assessments. Don't know about the until it dies bit. Maybe we'll just put that in relevance of workers' comp. Yeah. <coughs> oh, 
Oh, be like the geese. He's all feeling all warm and fuzzy now. So that's, that's essentially, I guess, what I wanted to talk about. I, the stay at work, recover and work concept is so much easier than the return to work process, but it takes a lot more to get this set up in your organisation before an injury happens, I guess. <laughs>